So a very warm welcome today from uh, Sion, Switzerland, from uh, the side of the Swiss Polar Institute team, from uh, Basile Farlende, uh, who uh, is uh, one of the main organizers of today's event, and Yelena Pistic, our communications officer, who is the other main <laughs> organizer of today. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all um, in such a numerous group on a, indeed a, a highly um, discussed topic, uh, which is uh, field work and the environmental impact of polar science. Um, I will start very, very briefly to give you an idea of why we are having this event and how it fits into the SPI activities. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Hod, and I'm the executive director at the Swiss Polar Institute, and I will moderate today's event, which we want to be um, an interactive event. So please do use the chat to ask your questions or raise your hand, and you will be given the floor uh, in the uh, question and answer session, or we will read your questions and ask you for comments if we don't understand everything, which sometimes happens. So um, I would like to just quickly mention that the Swiss Polar Institute is quite a young institution. It was founded six years ago now. And in the beginning, it uh, decided to put quite a strong focus on early career scientists for many reasons also, because we didn't have a lot of money to distribute. So it was where we felt we could have most added value and make a difference. We therefore created the Polar Access Fund. And this event that you're attending today actually um, is known internally here at SPI as the PAF event, annual PAF event, which is the event that we have originally created in order to bring together the grantees of our Polar Access Fund. It's a small grant that we give out every year in order to facilitate field work for early careers. Um, this is not a huge amount of money, but enables actually to have an independent grant in order to add some polar field work. And you see already now that we're entering right away the discussion topic to an existing science project. We also fund attendance of field and summer schools, um, dedicated events and networking opportunities, and we have a strong relation, relation sorry, with the Swiss um, chapter of Apex. So this event is geared towards ECRs primarily, but of course, everyone is welcome to attend and discuss. So today's event, uh, you will have seen the program has very slightly changed it, changed, and we are very thankful to our two last minute speakers, Piotr and Yannick. We will start with uh, an overview from Suzanne Hancock, who's the president for Apex International and who has many hats, notably one with Arctic Base Camp. And Susanna, I let you um, compliment on the hats that you also want to introduce. We will then continue with uh, uh, Piotr Elshout, who is at the European Polar Board in the Netherlands, and who is just completing a study on, an overview study, if I can say, on minimizing the environmental impact of polar research and logistics. And then we will take it um, a bit further into the practice with uh, Michael Lenning, who's a professor WSL and EPFL in Switzerland, and who has uh, concrete examples of his own or his team's participation in logistics in alpine, Arctic, and Antarctic environments, and who also is involved in developments of, of um, clean energy um, solutions for those environments. And finally, last but not least at all, um, we will um, speak with uh, Yannick Fagon, who is with the French IPEV, and who will um, speak about the challenges faced by an institution such as IPEV in um, taking into account the environmental footprint of their scientific station. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Susanna, and I will stop sharing, and you can take the hand, Susanna. Excellent. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. So yes, uh, so hopefully this can be seen now. I'm Susanna Hancock, so I'm, as 
I said, president of Apex International. I also am the science manager for Arctic Base Camp and a recent PhD from the University of Oxford. Science uh, Arctic Base Camp is a science communications platform. So I do my own research, but I'm also very interested in the communication of that through that work. And additionally, I've conducted my own field work throughout the European Arctic and Alaska, which includes three polar expeditions, and I'm currently considering my fourth. Uh, polar research obviously poses a significant ethical dilemma for, for me, for many of us, it's critical planet saving work, but it also has an environmental price that needs to be overcome. And I'll start by sharing two pictures from that I took on my most recent expedition. Uh, this one here is of one of my teammates and we are looking over what right in front of us has some ice, although there's lots of liquid water right around us that I was collecting some water samples from, but there's open ocean just beyond the photo. And this was a spot where an expedition that we were retracing from 150 years ago before was iced in for two years. So it was just one of those moments, you know, standing in a place knowing that this historically has been frozen and it isn't anymore. And so I said, so, you know, I took a lot of notes. I had to redo all of my notes because I was crying so much that the ink was running. <laughs> Uh, it was just a very visceral, a visceral moment for me. And, you know, the expedition, I mean, we, we had bodies of open water that we were unable to cross and we had to change our plans six times or so just as a result of, of open ocean that we weren't really expecting. And then this other photo is just skiing off a glacier in Svalbard. And you can see that we've, left a couple of polkas there as people have gone down to explore what the conditions are. This was right near a glacial river. And at one point, a bit a bit up the, up the glacier from here, we wanted to stop and take a photo. And I'm with actually the person sitting, sitting in the front of the screen there is a photographer. And he had a camera strap, strapped to his chest that he was all ready to take a picture and you know didn't have time to take to actually aim the camera and snap it because we wouldn't have gotten off that glacier. And that was just another moment of, you know, how quick are things changing? And so that was just, that was just another very personal moment for me. And I think I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience, but also what we're seeing in Apex, you know, and looking at ECRs and demands of, demands of ECRs now. And some of that's certainly a generational gap. Some of it's just rising of, of institutional pressures and not. So I'm going to talk both from yeah, my own perspective, but also, also through from Apex. So certainly one of the big goals, both for me and, and ECRs around the world is limiting emissions and environmental impact. So I've been part of the Apex leadership now for three years, president this year, vice president last year. And we've been developing new climate related groups that's been something that's been been, been a big push uh, for us that we are really getting from from our membership and so we have teamed up with the IPCC to run several reviews to really engage ECRs into that into that sphere we're currently in the midst of authoring a paper about that process and why ECRs really need to be involved in climate science and really be in that sphere that's still dominated by older generations Last year, we applied for the membership in the UNFCCC and have developed a working group on climate communications. This year, we also, or this past year, we also teamed up with EU Interact to write a book on reducing the CO2 emissions in Arctic science. And this does a lot with individual work. Yep, just got a coffee, coffee here. Uh, does a lot of with individual work, but also institutional institutions as well. But, you know, examples, this book being an example of ways in which younger generations are asserting environmental demands, you know, pushing away from it being individual and onto, onto the institution. So one of the big, one of the big ideas that's behind this, but also seeing it in conferences is that science can't really be neutral. We've grown up in an era in which we want to see science as apolitical, as neutral, as facts. But 
it can be emotional. And as scientists, we have this really unique platform to convey emotion that we are seeing things and it's up to us to share those. And so much of that gets lost when we try to sterilize all of the information. And that's been, that's been something that's really been coming up in a lot of conferences with, with presentations that afterwards like, well, that was great, but you didn't talk about anything that really gets the world on notice. You know, what you talked about was, was scary, was beautiful images but not the mobilization, not the urgency, and really how do we communicate communicate those areas? And you know that communication is also, I think, maybe with the era of social media being much more of a relevant aspect. You know, it's no longer okay just to publish something and assume that people read it because it was in some journal that your cohort cohort is read. That's not what communication is about. So how do we how do we reach beyond? established field and you know focusing right now on environmental impacts emissions etc but as somebody who straddles both social and natural science you know certainly looking at the social impacts as well those are absolutely significant who's involved in the research who isn't who's being affected who's benefiting so really seeing those as as key as key topics and so I'll share another picture just a little little cheesy picture here this is uh, last year, I was calling in over satellite phone to the World Economic Forum, where we were talking uh, really about what we were what we were actually seeing and what those emotional impacts are. But yeah, as a climate scientist, that's very public about my work. I definitely use use social media, but doing so really puts pressure on walking that walk, not just talking about it. You know, how often do we see the news jabbing at Climate scientists flocking to COP, for example, in how many thousands of planes? You know, how, do, how does that shape the message, the message in the media? So if I'm asking to people, if I'm asking people to reduce their environmental impact in an age when people are really holding people accountable and following, I need to really do that myself, really in order to get that credibility. So I'm finding though in my conversations, in work, with through through Apex, through other ECRs, that these alternative modes of transportation, for example, are very natural. So I, in January, took a train from World Economic Forum to Central Sweden, and it took me 35 hours. Uh, I love that time because I can get a lot of work done, fewer people can bother me, but you know, my cohort is very happy to say, we're going to just hop on a train. I'm going to take a train for 90 hours this summer. You're like That's just something you do, that's fine. Whereas still feel like it needs to defend it a little bit with institutions of, you know, why do you need to do this when you could just hop on a plane and be there in five hours? But also we're, you know, working with institutions, and that's one of the one of the points of the Interact book too, is how can institutions really see something like train travel as, you know, saving accommodations overnight, uh, the amount of work that you can get done on a train versus a flight that might be less time, but you spend time going through security and moving around a lot more. How can we move away from this eco piety to really institutional institutional change? So, you know, it's I think it comes down to that idea that if I'm going to complain about fossil fuel industries and emissions, I can't really dart around in a jet. So yeah, and really what what we can do as a society. There's also the idea that a lot of environmental impacts are not are not considered. And so really making sure that these are, for example, at COP27, I don't know if anybody, anybody else was there, but it was basically impossible to find a vegan food. And why is environmental impact of food not a priority at a climate conference, for example? So I'll just wrap up here just by saying that really, I think, our generation is saying that by not prioritizing the environment and doing everything possible that we really can do, it's really taking an impact on how we consider the science and degrading degrading that. So whether that's you know considering things like ski wax for expeditions or even the clothing fibers, making sure that carbon budgets are calculated along with any kind of risk assessment that would otherwise be included in a travel plan. And also figuring that as much fun as field work is, 
is it really necessary? Is, are there other ways to get that data? Or if you're in the field, what other data can you be collecting? You know, it's it might be more work for me or for somebody else to collect a little bit more research. But on this, you know, on my last trip to the field, I was collecting research for governments and for a university that needed data. And it was either me spending a little bit more time doing that, or they would both be shipping in other people with a much higher, much higher cost. So, you know, they, by, by using me, they basically got away with their research, the data that they needed with the zero, zero environmental impact. And so what, how can we include in research proposals, this kind of, this kind of information. So that is, I will wrap up there. Is there any other questions or we'll go? We'll continue Thank you, on. General. Um, I would like to propose that we go through the four quick presentations in a row, unless someone has not understood something important, but I think you were very clear. Uh, you pointed at many important points uh, from uh, how do we travel, how are we consequent in, in what we say and what we do, um, but also the temptation to actually go to the field because that's part of the drive for doing this job. Um, so I think these are all important points that we need to, um, to take up again afterwards, and I look forward to that. And I pass the word to Piotr um, to introduce the quick overview um, that he has prepared. Paired. Thank you, Daniela. So my name is Piotr Elshout. I'm project officer at the European Polar Board. Um, and today I'm presenting a report that's almost published on behalf of the action group of um, environmental impacts of polar research and logistics of the European Polar Board. Um, so I just want to mention I'm doing this on their behalf. So the report is a, a, a collaboration of a lot of people um, and I'm very happy I can present it on their behalf. So you will see that some pictures in the report that I'm going to show are not visible yet and others are because we're in the middle of process that um, we're getting approval for the images to be used. Um, so we're working on it and when that's done finally the report will be published so we're about halfway with that. So um, quickly about the EPB, we have four action groups and I'm talking about the environmental impacts action group that exists since 2018. Um, and our main deliverable is writing and publishing the report that we're about to publish. Um, and this report idea emerged in 2018 at Davos um, when there was a very big focus on uh, microplastics in the polar regions. But since then, we've expanded basically to consider more environmental impacts in the report that I will walk you through in a bit. Um, so it has become way broader um, and the report is mainly meant as a starting point. So it kind of uh, passes through different types of research and different environmental impacts and it associates them with each other. So it kind of looks at this kind of research produces potentially these kinds of impacts. And do we know any best practices um, that other ones can maybe take up and minimize their impacts? So the contents are obviously the methodology. Um, we have done literature studies of best practices that are already there. We've worked with other action groups. For example, uh, we're closely working with Interact, but also with IESC. Um, and we also use the expertise from the people in the action group, um, which are some operators, some polar researchers, um, and some directors of larger research institutes. So the chapter after the methodology is um, a chapter on actual environmental impact. So these are one pagers showing all the environmental impacts that we discuss in this report. And it's mainly meant as like um, an identification of how what we consider as the environmental impact in this report. Then the chapter after that is types of polar research. And those are two pagers elaborating on specific types of polar research, for example, using research vessels or uh, aircraft and then the environmental impacts that are associated with these types of research are then listed. So you can 
go back if you look for example at invasive species is listed at um at research vessels that you can go back to the chapter that it refers to to read more about invasive species and the risks associated with them um, then we have a chapter on logistics and infrastructures because during the discussions uh, in the action group it became pretty clear that it's one thing to actually conduct the polar research but it's another thing to keep a polar research infrastructure going with supplies um, and these kinds of things so some operators and some directors noted that a very big part of the carbon footprint of polar research is actually the logistics and not the actual research themselves so they wanted to look into how can we optimize this and how would that go in um, in reality because it's quite complicated because often you have different operators uh, supplying research stations than the research stations are operated by um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later then we have a short chapter on legal frameworks which is mainly as a reference uh, chapter to different legal frameworks that are applicable in different parts of the polar regions um, so it mainly lists parts and paragraphs that are interesting for polar researchers um, then we have some generic examples of best practices and experiences because the unique aspect of this report is that we're trying to uh, synthesize expertise from both polar regions to see if maybe in one region already something's happening that could be transferable to the other region. Um, and then we have a catalog of existing guidelines um, because we noted during our literature study that there's already a lot of guidelines and specific things. So we wanted to bring everything together. This is um, the introduction page of the environmental impact chapter. So as you see on the left, we have listed all the environmental impacts that we discuss in this report, which are carbon emissions, black carbon, invasive species, waste management, microplastics, wildlife disturbance, noise pollution, water consumption, soil degradation, um, and raw resources. So on the right, you see some variables that we use to assess these environmental impacts. So for example, we think about the geographical scale of the impact, the duration of the impact, and another one that's not on this page, but on the next page is the spread ability of an impact. So the one pagers look like this. This is the one about carbon dioxide and methane emissions. Um, and every one pager basically answers three questions about the environmental impacts what are carbon emissions in polar research how can polar research produce carbon emissions and what are the effects of carbon emissions on the polar regions and then we also have the uh, scale impact on the left and we do this per environmental impact i think the carbon uh, emissions is one that people are quite familiar with but for example the invasive species the noise pollution and these kinds of things i think are very um, specific to polar research. Then we discuss types of research in the report. So we discuss research vessels, research aircraft, terrestrial research facilities, large, large research campaigns, drones, automated sampling stations, individual researchers and field work and citizen science. And also in these two pages, we answer a couple of questions. So we define the research type that we work with in the report then we list environmental impacts potentially associated with this type of research and then we look at best practices that already exist to minimize the impact um, so we aim to find best practices that for example one research station already has uh, invented or figured out and to see if that's applicable to other research stations as well and then for the logistics, we look at terrestrial logistics and infrastructures, marine logistics and infrastructures, and airborne logistics and infrastructures. And there we discuss also a definition, what impacts are associated with this uh, kind of logistics and then the best practices. I think in this chapter, it's quite interesting because we came to the conclusion that, for example, for some national research stations, they heavily depend on the national military to uh, supply their research stations. Um, and that's quite difficult because, for example, one of the best practices of minimizing carbon footprints is to find the optimal speed for research vessels um, and slowing it down. But then the military often has such a busy schedule that they um, cannot really slow down so that you already have like a complicated friction because you kind of need to start negotiating with these things. Um, so I think that was a very interesting problem um, and something that I think 
it's not that easily solved, but also often maybe overlooked uh, with, with when you uh, want to minimize impacts. Then we have uh, legal frameworks considered, such as the Arctic Treaty system. Um, we look at the Arctic 8, but we mainly refer there to Interact, so the Arctic 8 countries, because Interact has a great overview of needed necessary permits and regulations. Um, so we, did, we didn't feel like duplicated the work. And then we also look at the Arctic Council agreements and the UNCLOS uh, treaty agreement um, and the clauses in there. And then we have some best practices that we try to synthesize. Um, so this is just an example of a couple that we have, but for example, reduce the carbon footprints of research vessels by finding the optimal speed, but that's sometimes a little tricky. Um, explore non-fossil fueled options, for example, when replacing old generators for research stations. Um, I was too winters ago in a research station in Kilpis Jarvi, and they were um, going to replace their fossil fuel generators with heat pumps and they could do that because they were adjacent to a lake. So I think it's quite interesting because all research stations are in different places so they can use different maybe uh, things in the surroundings. So it's always interesting to think about a research station where it is and what kind of options there would be. And like Susanna already said, I think coordination um, and efficiency is very, very important. So you ensure that when you have a campaign, it's completely optimally utilized um, so that everybody knows where you're going, what kind of data could be gathered, and to make sure that everything that can be gathered is actually gathered. Um, and I think a lot of communication is necessary for that. So the ways forward, the report will be launched coming weeks. There's already some interest from uh, people who are presented this to, to dive deeper into specific topics of the report. So maybe there is an opportunity to collaborate on that and to deepen out uh, things. So thank you for having me. Um, if you want to keep track of the European Polar Board, I listed our socials below and you will definitely see the report coming by there when it's published because I will be very happy when it's, uh, when it's out. Thank you, Piotr, Piotr, very much for this overview. And I think it's important that you underline this complexity of the actors involved. And of course, we speak of very different regions in the Arctic uh, and Antarctic, notably or high altitude uh, regions. Um, but um, that we sometimes find that some solutions might be quite easily reached, but actually need heavy compromises or negotiations. And that's uh, unfortunate, but hopefully, um, raising awareness more and more through all the different initi uh, initiatives that are currently ongoing will also uh, enable to put the pressure on such actors who are maybe a bit more immune to that type of pressure. And I would like to pass the word now to Michi Leni. Thanks, uh, Daniel. I think you can see my screen. I, I was given the title Tackling Environmental Impact of Fieldwork, a Comparative Perspective Between Alps Arctic and Antarctic. And I, and I think I will not uh, completely live up to this. I will just not be able to. But I it's think like a it, PhD uh, title. Yeah, it, it sounds like it would be more than a 10 minutes uh, <laughs> thing to do. But I will uh, give you, you know, a few glimpses of, uh, of our work here and what we are trying to do here. So our work in our starting with the content, what is our science about? What are we doing in extreme environments? So we are mostly concerned with the surface mass and energy balance of snow and ice. And we will also then transition over and say, you know, what we can actually learn for, um, that, so that there's kind of a, a, a back and forth there. So we learn from the extreme environments how to best do renewable energy energy and vice versa, and we want to use uh, renewable energy to learn more about the polar environments. That's, that's a bit the approach that we are putting forward there. Now, um, our research is, um, you know, in, in the Alps, uh, for example, uh, we are uh, very close uh, uh, out of uh, now New Sion, or I I'm, uh, have been part of my group here in Davos, where I'm sitting right now, and it has been snowing last uh, few days. Now, what, what we're interested there is uh, to characterize snow distribution, not only, but also the snow quality with respect to avalanche formation and other natural hazards. In general, it's snow atmosphere inter 
action snow melt in mountain regions worldwide. The station that you see on the picture is in Tajikistan. And it's there, it's, it's not a usual, just a normal meteorological station for those that are familiar with some of the instruments. We have a sonic imometer on top here, and we also have a flow cap a sensor that, that is um, measuring drifting and blowing snow. And we are doing this to uh, characterize turbulent fluxes under the influence of drifting blowing snow to get to know how much uh, sublimation we have in these areas. This, this is a general aim, so this is very important because this is kind of the, the red line that goes through the, um, the red thread that goes through all of our work is uh, if we know uh, how much snow we have on the ground, we can also say how much it must have been snowing, and this is something that is not very well known in extreme environments. So characterizing the processes in the, on the snow and in the snow helps us to understand the meteorology of these sites. And we do this... Um, mostly by model analysis. So our, our group is, is not primarily an experimental group. We do much more modeling than uh, doing own experiments and uh, going to the field, but we do go to the field. And in the field, uh, in the Alps, we have mostly meteorological stations. Uh, we have drone flights and use satellite data and almost not any more manned flight missions. So we used when, you know, when the, the drones were in that, uh, at the capability that they have nowadays, we were also putting our scanning lidars um, or photogrammetry instruments on manned flight missions, either on a helicopter or a fixed wing airplane. But this could be almost completely replaced by drones, and uh, it's needless to say that this uh, the drone operation is, of course, much uh, much has of course much less uh, CO two emissions than manned flight missions. So overall, maybe as a First thing, the stuff that we do in the mountains is uh, uh, fairly um, environmentally friendly. And uh, if if you are of course disturbed by the uh, by the drones or also by these stations, that uh, you can also see that these pollute the landscape. But the footprints are relatively small. This is um, already becoming a little bit different. If you now go uh, to Antarctica. Well, we all know first we need to to go there. So, but what we do there is uh, is similarly we characterize snow distribution, snow quality, snow atmosphere interactions, and in particular also their sublimation with similar stations as we have just seen for Tajikistan. Here, maybe the instrument to point out is a snow particle counter (SPC) as opposed to the flow cat. We also do have flow cats in Antarctica. So, also the same. Um, suite of things uh, that we are using there um, as, as in the Alps. Uh, overall, I would say um, what we have been doing is, is in a rather slim alpine style. So we go there, one or two persons at that, um, and uh, we, we build those stations there. We do some manual measurements, and overall the environmental impact is is mostly uh, uh, restricted to the, to the transport. We all know that transport is a is a big, uh, uh, let's say, a big part of uh, all the CO2 emissions. I come a little bit more to this later. Even more, though, than most of our work has been out of the uh, renewable station, the Princess Elizabeth station, which runs on renewable energy, and I will also mention this more. Now, if we go to the Arctic, and uh, we were participating in the mosaic, and I, I threw some numbers together, so you've probably seen those numbers, but I always uh, forget them then uh, in between, and I have to remind myself what they were. These are all estimates, and so don't take me on the exact numbers, but for Polar Stern, the total fuel consumption um, during the whole campaign was about uh, 10,000 tons, or you know, roughly what that would be an equivalent of 30,000 tons of CO2 being produced. In, then you have to compare this uh, to uh, about one ton of CO2 uh, produced on a transatlantic trans flight or four tons per person average in, in Switzerland, so overall the population. So you can see that, that the mosaic uh, is a, was a, uh, a campaign uh, with uh, very heavy logistics. But on the other hand, you have to say, you know, for, there was, for, it was serving 400 people, uh, went on for a full year. And when you take this into consideration and the multitude of measurements that are um, being conducted, you know, this integrative um, assessment of the, the sea ice ecosystem with uh, 
snow, ice, atmosphere interactions and ecosystem below the ice and all of this together. And you can also see that uh, that this what the total production, if you compare this to Amundsen and Scott, for example, at about uh, 1,900 tons uh, per year fuel consumption here, uh, not uh, CO2 production. Then you would say that okay, this is um, you know not so far off anymore. And um, for comparison, Neumeyer three, that's a station we also collaborate with, has about 300 uh, tons of um, fuel consumption uh, per year. What is not in these numbers is, of course, so the refurbishing, transport, and, and leftovers. Um, so I will give you a few things there. But first of all, I also saw that Amy is in the audience. Uh, so this uh, this very beautiful picture of, of mosaic, uh, just to underline the multitude of questions and uh, you know very clearly what what a big uh, enterprise this has been, and uh, really also a role model in terms of scientific collaboration. So pointing out not only the the massive um, logistical um, effort that had to be made, but also the the benefits of such a coordinated action. Amy, of course, I know you have also been working on this. I'm asking you in the, the forefield, uh, or you can just jump in if you have additional information or you want to correct something, don't hesitate. So what I've been saying with respect to you know the fuel consumption in Mosaic was only uh, the, the numbers that uh, apply to the polar stand, but then you know the bringing in additional fuel um, and change over crew with uh, in this case two big Russian icebreakers. This this is not even there yet. So this comes on in addition, but. We also have to worry about other impacts. So I've been, you know, witnessed myself in, in Antarctica, but also in the Arctic. Um, when you go to places uh, where the infrastructure has been left over and sometimes not uh, properly cleaned out, then uh, these are also impacts uh, that uh, we have to be aware of. And so you know, all, all plans of uh, expedition should always uh, have a very clear plan also of how to dismantle and to go back. So now what I want to say is quickly um, some sorts of need for action. Well, first of all, we need to accept the fact that we are born uh, consumers and not producers, right? We, we don't have chlorophyll in our skin. And so that while the plants to take the CO2 and produce energy, we do usually the opposite. So in, in principle, whatever we do as humans uh, will produce some CO2. And so that would, you know, the, the direct conclusion Will be well. It's an average. Of course, we can we can play with things and uh, and play a little bit plant here and there. But uh, just just be aware of you know whatever we do in our civilization. And so the the real um, conclusion is that at the end of the day, we need to do maybe less or with less effort. Uh, and so you know things are happening all over the place. So you can see for the Neumeyer station, they put up a wind turbine there. And this is for most of the extreme environments, uh, the two things that can be done best, you know, to work with, uh, with solar and wind. We can also state that while extreme environment expeditions have very significant emissions, as, as just mentioned before, the overall magnitude compared to what civilization does um, as a whole is, is relatively small. So think about uh, if even if you compare Mosaic to the operation of cruise ships that also run at the same fuel consumption, then you would say, okay, you know, we are have one one uh, polar stand for one year, and how many cruise ships are are sailing the world, or other forms of tourism. So there, I would just as a hypothesis, or maybe as a as a statement to debate afterwards, uh, put there we probably have to do two things. We have to work on the reduction of these emissions in the extreme environment themselves. We have heard about how that uh, in, in the previous talks, but we also have to work on the transformation of societies worldwide and act within our own sphere of influence there. Okay, so here, the good example of the Princess Elizabeth station with wind and solar power. I have been there, so they also have uh, advanced uh, treatment of waste, uh, water, et cetera. So I think this is a very good example and, and has been operating in this mode for 
many years now. Uh, so there's think uh, as, a, as a role model in that sense is the solar and wind installations. And just to remind everybody, a lot of the consumption is actually in the transport. And I said, you know, there's other aspects as the refurbishing of fuel towards Polarsch. And you can say the same for Scott Amundsen, every ton of fuel that is burned there is of course uh, has had to be hold there and so the the total consumption for every liter that is burned there is much higher and this is something that you also have to consider when you do your your budgeting that happens uh, somewhere so what we do then uh, we're trying to bring the uh, some of the knowledge uh, for example the knowledge on snow radiation interaction we try to apply and say okay we can um, uh, help in finding out what is the best energy mix not only for a polar station but also for switzerland as a whole to give the example of switzerland and i've uh, brought this uh, example here that shows um, if you were to install so much uh, photovoltaic and wind in switzerland such that you, the production of these renewable matches consumption on a on a, a yearly average, then uh, you would uh, see that the that and this is shown the, on the black Swiss map on the top. You see how much uh, solar you start with a lot of solar because this is something um, that uh, the politics now support very strongly. But you would see that it's actually more optimal to install more wind, and there is good places for wind in Switzerland such that the mix goes to a stable overall operation of the Swiss electricity system. So again, um, and I'll, I'll stop here, basically saying one thing, um, as, uh, as polar scientists, uh, we need to work hard to reduce our emissions there and to become um, more, uh, to get to more uh, sustainable energy solutions, but even more so we need to bring also the message back into society and show general pathways of a more sustainable operation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michi. And um, maybe I want to pick up quickly on two points. One, for those who are not alpinists or don't actually do mountaineering, the alpine style is very light indeed, but tends to be rather um, a solo or very small team and not very collaborative one. So maybe we can combine collaboration with the uh, Alpine staff. Sorry. So you lost me on the transport. So I, I wanted to underline, and that makes the link with Yannick, um, that uh, the, uh, uh, oops, sorry, um, that the French uh, IPEV has also done a study, uh, I think a few years ago, or it was audited about its Im uh, impact and CO2 outputs. And indeed, transport came out far above uh, the operation of the stations itself. So um, this is indeed a major challenge. I would like to pass the floor to Yannick um, to share his presentation and take the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to participate in this workshop. I will try uh, to have a, a very brief uh, presentation. So I am working at the French Polar Institute and uh, the French Polar Institute is a public agency with uh, a lot of ministry, uh, foreign affairs and uh, also the French Southern Antarctic Territories uh, Authority and four scientific agencies uh, from research, spatial, sea and weather. We have uh, a lot of missions, but the more important uh, difference for our institute that we have any uh, scientists, researchers in our institute. We are only logisticians. Every year, um, uh, there are some meetings who decide which uh, scientists uh, will go to the uh, polar um, stations. So uh, we are only uh, logisticians, and uh, we have only two scientists who decide with a committee who, uh, which scientist, uh, French one or foreign, uh, European one or international one, can uh, uh, go to the polar uh, French uh, stations. We are only 50 people uh, at the head office. And uh, uh, at the top, uh, during the Austral summer, there are 200 people on the ground in a different uh, station. Uh, every year, about uh, 90 projects are supported by the Institute. 
and uh, so 360 scientists are working in polar stations. And each year, 450 tons of materials are delivered to the French stations. Here, uh, we have uh, different areas uh, of action in the Arctic, in the uh, Svalbard Archipelago. To, uh, we have a station in Nihilation and uh, near Nihilation, a little one uh, is a Corbel station. We have also a station in the French sub-Antarctic islands. There are three uh, sub-Antarctic islands uh, near from uh, Africa, the south of Africa. And uh, we go to this uh, three island with a French boat uh, called Marion Dufresne. And uh, we have also uh, three stations in Antarctica. And uh, we go to this station from Hobart in Tasmania, uh, near Australia to Antarctica, uh, dumont uh, station. We have also uh, uh, another station in the continent, uh, Concordia, with, uh, with uh, the Italian uh, Polar Institute. The biggest one in Antarctica is dumont station. Uh, this station is based on petrol, Petrol's Island in the archipelago of Point Geology. Temperature is uh, minus one on average in summer on uh, minus uh, uh, 17 in winter, and uh, there are a lot of uh, winds, kabatic winds, up to uh, 250 kilometers per hour. Here on this picture, you can see uh, the island, and the continent uh, is uh, only 200 meters uh, behind uh, the island. But uh, some years during the uh, austral uh, summer, there is water between uh, our station and uh, the continent. Near this uh, station, there is another one, uh, the Robert Gear station on the continent, who uh, authorized us to go to the Concordia station with uh, traction, traction motor engines. And here you've got the Concordia station uh, in the heart of the continent, 1,000 kilometers uh, in the heart of the continent. And uh, we are uh, 3,000 uh, meters uh, up. And uh, the temperature is uh, minus 30 on average in summer and minus 60 on average in, uh, in winter. And uh, this uh, station, uh, we, we occupy it with uh, Italian uh, uh, logistician and researcher. So about uh, the theme of uh, our discussion, about the, food, the environmental footprint of uh, our actions in the polar regions, we ask the scientists or the, the researchers who what has the point of view and uh, is uh, uh, do, do we have to go there? And uh, most of them answer us, yes, we need to go to the polar sites uh, because we need to acquire field data and not everything can be analyzed from models. So this is a part of the answers. And uh, as I explained to you, uh, the French Polar Institute is only based of logistic affairs or logisticians. So we have to support them to go to the, these polar regions. And our main requirement, our scientific campaign, is the safety, the security of uh, the researchers and the scientists. And uh, during the Austral summer, there are maybe uh, 80 uh, members and researchers who are working on polar region in uh, dumont for example. During the winter, the Oswald winter, there is only uh, 20 uh, people who, who stay uh, at the station. So we need to provide them enough energy, enough food, and we need to ensure 24-hour operation. Uh, and we must choose proven solutions because uh, they are alone. And um, the maritime supplied by, by the Astrolab is uh, by seven-day crossing from uh, Tasmania to uh, Antarctica. So uh, it's very important for us to, uh, to choose proven solutions to guarantee them uh, that everything uh, will be OK during the, uh, the campaign. And uh, the environmental issues uh, that we are studied in, uh, in the French polar attitude is about the wastewater, uh, the rubbish, uh, the rubbish for food, construction waste. And uh, obviously, uh, our main uh, issue is the renewable energy. Uh, solar thermal energy, photovoltaic energy, wind energy, and maybe hydrogen. Uh, there are some tests uh, were made on those uh, stations. But uh, as I said, we have to choose proven solutions. So 
the lot of experimentations before we decide to uh, to take uh, our energy from um, wind uh, wind construction. And uh, for myself, I'm a project manager of a, a new project for the French Polar Institute, which is to modernize uh, our uh, main station in Antarctica, uh, Dumont Durville. And uh, our project is to modernize it uh, by uh, 2050. And uh, this uh, project uh, has been initiated in 2019. All of uh, the environmental uh, footprint that uh, we talk about uh, during uh, our workshop are our issues uh, like energy, waste, renewable energy. And uh, we have to take uh, about uh, the scientific orientation for so 30 years. And uh, we have to improve uh, our technologies and our uh, our choices to, uh, to choose technical in innovations, uh, which can uh, provide us proven solution to be sure that uh, our researchers on, and our members has our safety uh, in our stations. Thank you for your intention. Thank you very much, Yannick, for, um, for your presentation. I think it was very important that you underlined also this element of, um, of safety um, for everyone involved. Um, I think this is something, obviously, as an operator, you cannot jeopardize, and uh, that is central. And I would like to um, propose that we move now with uh, half an hour into the discussion uh, for this um, uh, for this um, event. So, if uh, you would like to put maybe your uh, cameras back on in order to ask your questions, that would be nice. And maybe in the meantime, I would like to underline that there is yet another actor that we haven't actually been discussing right now in the system, where there are many but is also the funders. And as a Swiss Polar Institute, we are a funding body. We are not an operator, operator. Uh, we are not a user, but we are somewhere in between as a multiplier. And we find our place not always easy, maybe I should say, with regard to how we can incentivize, if that's the real English word, um, both parties towards um, a reduction of use, of course, the more people apply to us and the more funding we have to distribute, the more successful we feel we are. Um, so we have a contradiction in ourselves. Um, so a few years back, we introduced compensation of carbon emissions as an eligible cost in our grants, which is not a perfect measure by any means, um, but that was a start. And also in our application forms, we asked um, applicants to justify how they were, um, uh, the, the travel that they wanted to do, its added value, and also the reduction strategies that they were putting in place. Um, this is absolutely not enough. And today we are looking at how to do more. And for example, we are looking at good ideas and there I would be thankful for feedbacks on, for example, how to give a bonus for those who are sharing data or collection opportunities. This has a cost for those who offer to take someone along or to share data. So how do we as funders and maybe also as operators um, give a bonus or a, a reward to those who actually take that burden on themselves? Um, how do we approve, um, improve accounting for, uh, or how do we measure actually the impact that we have indirectly through our grants? That's quite difficult. And especially what is the, uh, the link with technology development. We've discussed uh, the risks of new technologies and we've discussed some of uh, the opportunities that Michi notably has uh, sees, um, and I'm sure others too. But where is our role in maybe supporting funding towards such solutions cleaner for cleaner polar science? So that's maybe an element that I'm happy to take questions on as well. Um, but I would like to open the floor and my colleagues have been uh, collecting the questions. So who should I give the floor to first? Yeah, I had I have actually a question for everyone who spoke because I think all of these topics were were really great to to bring up different components of of this like problem of going into the field and producing emissions. Um, I think I'll start with a question for for Mickey for Mickey Lenning. Um, and I think one of the big problems that we're facing is conducting 
kind of a impact assessment with approximations before going on an expedition is often leading to very different values um, returning. And I think if I was just wondering if you had an opinion as to whether it's feasible for scientists in, in also maybe from the from the opinion of Arctic, Antarctic and the Alps. If you think a it's feasible for scientists to be able to conduct impact assessments themselves um and alter and the other question would be if it's possible to do it like before and after so we can get like an approximate value and then actually what happened in the field uh, upon returning um and maybe gain some knowledge about kind of best practices so i was wondering mickey if you um have thought about this yeah, thanks, Amy. And uh, yeah, if you if you have updated numbers for Mosaic, uh, you can also mention them. But but I think it's very important to do that because uh, and I think I want to bridge to what uh, what we heard previously with a question from Daniel. What the funders can do, I think the funders can request that the you know the impact assessment is part of the proposal, and uh, and then you know then you also basically provide the funding for that part of the work. And I think that, I mean, as scientists, you know, we, we are used to analyze stuff. And if you are in, in the Arctic or in the Antarctic or in any of these, uh, these places, you, you see a lot of things that are um, a bit unexpected. And then therefore, I think the before and after is, is very important uh, to learn. And then, I mean, this time, I, I guess the gap between before and after must Increase quite significantly as we as we learn what's actually happening, and there's there's lots of unforeseen stuff. I mean, as, I mean, you know, this the better than me be having been on yourself on on the mosaic. You know, there there was a plan, and then there was a, a some some quite big deviations from the original plan with some quite uh, significant uh, consequences. I think also for the total consumption of uh, fuel and energy. Thank you. Maybe that would be a question that could be also asked to Piotr. Is that an issue that was discussed at all to have um, the development of methodologies for quantifying, um, I mean, in a sort of, I don't like that word, but harmonized or at least um, sort of, uh, well, for, yeah, anyway, uh, I, I suppose harmonized will do uh, way so that scientists don't all start their own method for calculating their their impact. Um, if if uh, funders and operators are to uh, to try to to measure better what impact each action has, um, should they each invent their own methodology? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's also um, interesting about <laughs> seeing these different perspectives because we haven't talked much about the funding aspect. So we were mainly focusing on the actual researchers um, and the operators, but not necessarily on uh, the environmental impact assessments. So I think that's a super valid point to add to that. Uh, perspective because I think if you add that then you have a full circle of the three things that actually could influence each other so mm -hmm. that's why I like these sessions <laughs> okay so to put on your to-do list um and we have a question from Regent Skalmer hello um it's a question for Yannick um and it's following this conversation about as a logistical institute so you keep track of the fuel consumption, the um, waste management, and I'm curious about how available these data are for the scientists. If, for example, they want to write an environmental report, because um, with Amy and Maddie, we have been working for the Mosaic Impact Report, and one of the main problems was to get um, in touch with the, um, the ship company. And we waited a very long time to get all these numbers and they're not in, I mean, there's a lot of work to do to get them in the right format that we could use. So I'm curious to see you, to hear about your experience about sharing all this kind of like um, emission environmental impact with the scientists. And um, if you have done that and if you um, think about doing that in the future or how do you plan to like, get these numbers accessible for the community? Uh, thank you for your, your question. Um, 
I don't know if we uh, had ever done uh, this uh, sharing of uh, our uh, environmental uh, impact, but uh, I'm sure that now it will be uh, able. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the shipping company that we use to go from uh, Tasmania to uh, Hobart is, is a, a public one. Uh, so uh, uh, it is a, a French one. So for uh, it's not a military one. It's a, uh, a public uh, one. And uh, I think it is a very uh, easy for us to, uh, to have this information. Uh, all our fuel consumptions uh, are public. Uh, we, have, we have no matter to... Uh, to say to you that we use uh, uh, um, 300,000 uh, of liters of uh, fuel every year uh, to, uh, to, to make our station uh, uh, on the way. Uh, for example, uh, only 3% of this fuel consumption is for the engines. All of the other part is for the generators or the heating um, uh, loops. So. Uh, uh, I think uh, we are able to uh, to have some technical uh, discussions with uh, uh, you uh, about this uh, uh, with about our um, consumption. So uh, I think you can uh, write to the French Polar Institute, and uh, we will be very happy to to share this uh, uh, this production. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think this issue of transparency, maybe Piotr also for follow up, is an important one. Um, and I know that uh, you had other questions, Amy. I wanted to uh, maybe raise one question that is uh, maybe uh, for uh, the different persons uh, who spoke, but maybe also for some of the participants, is how, how do you see the balance of the technology or reduction versus psychology in the solutions or partial solutions of what we are discussing here? Because to a great extent, it's also about ourselves revising to a certain degree the whole issue of collaboration and competition in science you know if i send someone else to collect my data is, am i like a complete scientist mm, or can um, do i feel more like a complete scientist if i've contributed to find a technological solution to to reduce the impact of my field work susanna maybe you want to start uh, so I think this is something that's that's changing too and under shifts. But I know when I was doing graduate school and at university, you know, there's this idea that you're going to go do field work, and once you've done field work, then you're, you're real. You know, then you contribute it, then you're a scientist. And otherwise, you know, you're analyzing data that somebody else already has. And even if that's data that was technically collected for you specifically, but you didn't do that collection. And I don't know how much of that is is field specific. I started off my career actually in astrophysics where there are a lot of people who are just, all they are doing is collecting data for people. And it's just, you send, you tell people who are at, at telescopes, I need this recorded, I need this, and then send it to me. And they're literally sitting there just not doing their own research, just collecting data for all of these people. And she considered a very legitimate way of doing research. And then when I got into a field where Field research is part of it. It was sort of a rite of passage. And it was this expectation that you go through this and you don't ask somebody else to get your data. But I think that was a system that's, you know, that that is that is shifting. I mean, we've shown that it doesn't need to be that way, but it's just this expectation still that, you know, this is this is what you're coming, this is what you're going to come into. But academia is shifting as well. And there are a lot of changes in it. So I don't know that one necessarily needs to be involved hands-on directly to getting that credit or feeling credited as a real scientist. I think that it's really what you're doing with it and the communication aspect. I think we're also finding that if you want to be a real scientist, so to speak, using real and in air quotes there, that it's also what you're doing with your science. And what is the impact that that's having? And part of that impact is accountability for how you got that data. Um, does any of the other early career scientists, maybe some of those, uh, yeah, or Piotr, you wanted to react? 
Well, I was just thinking about this, um, not from the action group of the EPB perspective, but from involvement in the EU Boda cluster and also the Project Interact. I think Corona has changed this a lot because um, what I noticed, I organized a meeting for 29 EU Horizon projects uh, during Corona how to cope with the pandemic and their research. Um, and one of the conclusions was that station managers that are situated at the stations can really well sample for scientists and um, one of the best practices out of the terrible situation was that that it was actually working really well um, and that that also was something that made them rethink about well, what kind of data do we need to go and what kind of data we can have collected by station operators and managers that are not necessarily there to do the science but are there to maintain the station so I don't know how that's now continuing now Corona is gone, but I think in those two years, it was proven quite well that that's something that can definitely work in some cases. Definitely, definitely second that. And I think it's also changed on the communication side too, you know, that uh, conferences can be done remotely and that's an acceptable format of a conference. You don't need to have gone somewhere for that to show where you've spoken. It's it's perfectly fine to do it online. And but yes, yeah, certainly getting creative with how can we collect data and how do we understand that. So exactly what Pietro was just saying. Very good. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe, um, I'm, maybe I'm too old to comment on that as a, not an early career scientist. <laughs> But I do it anyway. So there's two aspects to this question. There's the one of uh, you know how to get uh, most efficiently to the data, and I, I I do not think, and I have never thought so in my whole career that it is necessary to do field work to prove yourself as a real scientist. I mean, your astrophysics example shows that very well. You know that you, in some disciplines you simply don't have the the, the opportunity to do so. So uh, this is not at all necessary. You know, you but but there is another aspect is because uh, you know that astrophysicist has not. The opportunity to go uh, to Mars and observe what's going on on Mars in person, and and so, so you know the, the our our the scientists in our field they have that and they learn a lot when they are there and they they observe and they are they are ex exposed and so this this is uh, why I like to give the opportunity also to to people in the group to go and to get this experience and you know even. This is a disadvantage of maybe not having not the most effective way to collect the data then. Thank you very much, Michi. Amy, you had more questions. So before someone else uh, raises his or her hand, you have the floor. Um, yeah, I think I had I just a comment on this um on this topic that we're currently talking about. So I think um I really like how this direction, how the conversation is going, and I think actually having 30 people on this call and we're already grouping together people who are like interested in this topic and we're going to have conversations about this where everyone's very supportive but I think it's very important to mention that this is not like this is not in the scientific community yet um quite a lot of people are it's not on the radio radar to reduce the impact and I think one big push um yes of course like collecting the data is at the focus, but I think um, one thing that needs to kind of be shifted in our, um, in the dialect is really that we create this weighting of the environmental impact with the scientific impact. And I think we need to accept that sometimes um, we're gonna have to take a reduction in the data collection when when this, this balance isn't correct. And I think it's trying to understand um, like when that is needed and when we need to say like, no, this, in, this isn't gonna go ahead. The science might be fantastic, but we need to take, or we need to develop more technologies before we can do this expedition or this, this field work campaign. Um, we need to take these steps before accepting this proposal um, on the environmental impact side. And I think that dialect needs to be um, talked about a bit more in, the, in this community saying like a bit of a, a bit more of a push um, to have that as a as a weighting in when deciding the the proposals. Um, and then I was I was going to ask a question to Susanna. Um, so I think I'm I'm very personally I'm very much interested in how the science and policy um, can like link together and how from an early career perspective 
uh, how, how I could possibly influence policy um, through my science. But I always found it quite confusing and I never really knew like what direction to go into this. And I think it's a very like personal journey. Um, but I was wondering if, if you thought about maybe setting up like a, or even SPI, Daniela, like setting up maybe some, some links with like, trying to help um, early career researchers go and get into the science, science and policy. Um, I think that was, yeah. yeah. So just touching up on that briefly, and Amy, you probably, well, you may know, uh, when I was mentioning just with APEC, some of the demands for groups that we've had recently have been climate, but one that came out two and a bit years ago was on science diplomacy and looking also from a climate, through a climate lens, but looking at how do we access, access that. And I've had well, I think what's been interesting to me is I've always seen policy, and this is me being told as much as me experiencing it, that it is this something that's very stoic and solemn. But I, I had some meetings one on ones with high international in, uh, emitters this past year, and seeing them break down into tears about the environmental impact because they you know they know what they're causing and they know what the damages are and you know the face that they have to put on publicly versus versus the off record is really astounding and how to get us really being able to go into those conversations and have them have them influential rather than you know you leave those off record meetings and then you come to actually talk to the policy makers and decision makers and try to pretend everything's fine and it's that's happening on both sides so I, there's, there's, a, there's a gap that we somehow need to bridge where we need to be a little bit more comfortable talking. And I don't know if that's, again, I don't know if that's a generational thing. I don't know if that's a sector, certainly a sector thing as well. Um, but yeah, how can, we, how can we create that? But that is certainly that science diplomacy and policy and accessing decision makers is a really important, important component. So clearly, I mean, APEX is an interesting forum for this at a more global level. I mean, you can, uh, of course, from the Swiss side, I mean, APEX and SPI can maybe also discuss, you know, how to uh, uh, come together and, and discuss and maybe have a uh, exchange forum or even uh, this could be the topic of our next uh, of our next uh, Polar Access Fund event, uh, although it's maybe a bit late to wait a year for this, so we can we can definitely discuss. I would like to get back to this important point on the weight of the impact um, of the science versus the environmental impact, because this this actually brings in as a totally central actor, as someone who is never at the table of these discussions in the polar world, which are the national research councils, which are the biggest funders for science. Um, in most countries, uh, the INR in France, uh, NERC in the UK, the SNF in Switzerland, the FG, these are the major funders who are not, I think, currently um, armed in order to evaluate this element of science, especially for polar science. So I think already for um, I mean, the organization of uh, uh, that yeah, the organization that Yannick represents here for the operators, it's not an easy task, I think, to decide um, whether um, the science that takes one birth on board a certain ship is worth more than the science uh, of another birth um, in order to, to mitigate uh, or who deserves to have that CO2 output. For the funders, it's even more difficult. Um, um, because we don't necessarily have this information on the CO2 output, so we would need to have very good figures in order to be able to put them in the balance of the classical peer review, which is really based on purely the science excellence. So that becomes a very interesting and, and probably necessary equation. I'm not trying to chicken out of this, but this is, this is, uh, this is a very interesting evaluation criterion. Um, but I think um, the very large funding organizations would feel very disarmed having to deal with that. And I think this is probably an issue that we need to bring further into the arena beyond the polar world if, if this needs to, to, be, uh, 
to be considered. So I think that's maybe something uh, to, to remember. I don't think we can tackle it right here, um, but surely um, that's an element for the future of peer review overall that's actually interesting and beyond polar science potentially. Um, very good. Do we have other points or questions or reactions that are burning? Or does one of you want to comment on what I just said? Yeah, Renuka. Yeah, uh, it was super interesting, the point that you just brought up. And I see that there is someone from EPEV here, so maybe they can comment further on that. Um, the, the aspect of the importance of uh, being there and doing research in the polar world versus what it costs us on an environmental viewpoint. This is something that EPEV have definitely looked at the carbon footprints, I think, of polar research, as far as I understand. And so, and there are other organizations as well in Europe, particularly, that are looking at that perspective already. Um, I think it's super interesting to propose that the that the funding agencies look at this aspect because um it might be something like in it might be something that might give some weightage to research but you also have to think that might uh, basically set up the field for the kinds of research that are not carbon footprint heavy which is also not something that you want so you you want to really ensure that the research that's needed is being carried out and not the research that's just carbon footprint light for the sake of being carbon footprint light. So that was my point that there is some work going on already in Europe and that's something that you might want to consider extremely carefully if you want to suggest something like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have um, in the chat actually uh, um, an interesting comment by Basil Davis. He actually uh, underlines how difficult it is to get uh, good uh, sharing data sharing solutions going and funded uh, for uh, certain types of digital infrastructure. Because definitely the issue of data sharing is a crucial one when it comes to maximizing the impact of science that's already been to the field. Um, so it's definitely an important point, and I think we, we, we take good note of that, yes. If there are no other burning questions, I will maybe try a, a short wrap-up, but I would like to first um, invite our different panelists um, to uh, maybe uh, share with us one last thought, also a reaction to what has been discussed, if there is something that struck them or that, um, or that they feel they can take away from this discussion for their own organizations. I would be very thankful if you want to share. Um, yeah, thank you, Basil. Your uh, comment is well noted. Um, and if you want to share something that you want to take away, um, then you are most welcome to quickly take the floor now. So it would be Michi, uh, Susanna, Piotr, and Yannick in the order that you want, if you wish. Yeah, if, if I if I may may start, I, I think it this this last input was was quite important uh, that it's a it's a real challenge to to uh, find out what is the the most uh, you want to call it valuable research and and then compare it to the CO two or what or the climate footprint or environmental footprint in, in in more general. But if if we don't answer that as scientists, who else would do that? So I think that's that's our task. <laughs> Thank you. Nice one, Mihi. Susanna. Yeah, thank you again. I think for me, the big takeaway is that there's so much that as individuals, we don't necessarily know about best practice and we can all just be learning from each other and who's doing what, how, how are things done? I mean, learning that some institution is requiring carbon offsetting, for example, and finding out what your policies are, your institution. I think there's just a lot that we don't consider and that has to do with our own circles and what we know and what we use and if we're not necessarily doing field work we don't necessarily know about all of the emissions associated with the logistics etc so really just learning from each other and seeing what's out there and then what can we take to implement in our own research in our own work 
thank you. And maybe before I pass the floor to Piotr, I, I think there is a, a question which kind of goes towards you in, in the chat and which says, it's from Naomi Kartig who says, I'd agree that coordinated synergies are crucial, um, fostering collaboration amongst nations, and research projects would enable required optimized usage of existing infrastructure and resources. Do relevant international actions exist? And well, there are some for sharing infrastructure, but not necessarily for sharing projects. So maybe you know more. So if you want to integrate that into your conclusion, that'd be nice. Sorry for the trap. No worries. Um, I think actually the organization I work for is one example because it's 29 organizations working together to do this. Um, also from the perspective to be more efficient, I think in Europe, especially historically, there is a very long tradition on national research. And right now people also understand that we can do stuff together. So I think uh, the European Polar Board is a good example. I think the EU Polar Cluster is a good example of uh, many EU projects, seeing how they can collaborate and synergize. Um, I think there are also initiatives between, um, yeah, how do you say that? Not international, but continental organizations. So um, for example, our organization sometimes speaks with AFOPS, which is the Asian counterpart, and they also uh, share information about, for example, the infrastructures that we operate and potential working together. Um, also seeing who has space um, and how we can optimize the space. So I think this is already happening, uh, at least from what I see. Um, I hope that's sufficient. Um, and from this session, I think I take away that um, what I already took away a little bit from writing this report is that every organization right now seems to be working on this with a slightly different perspective. And I think if we can add all these perspectives together, we can create more of a, a harmonious overview of where the necessities are um, and what kind of uh, solutions we can come up with with different perspectives, be it organizational or more uh, operational or more uh, scientific perspective. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yannick. Um, thank you for this workshop. Um, I want to say that uh, the French Polar Institute is convinced that uh, scientists or researchers are not uh, single users of our stations. And uh, we would be very happy if uh, they consider and uh, that they can help us to imagine uh, our new infrastructures on uh, our new uh, stations. And uh, to con to, as a conclusion, I can say that, for example, we are on Petrel Island uh, for 50 years and we arrived there by accident because there were uh, one of our buildings was on fire. So we had to leave the continent to go to this island, but this island uh, has, had got um, a little building uh, uh, on uh, the rocks where all groups of penguins uh, grow. And uh, for 50 years, we build and uh, we go on building our stations uh, among these penguins. This is very uh, interesting for scientists to be uh, uh, around these uh, penguins. But uh, as we uh, heard uh, during our workshop, it uh, it 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 took it um, uh, it is a, a big question for us about our impact. So, for the first time the, this year, we ask our scientists if uh, they are open to to go back to the continent. They they had never asked themselves this question. Uh, they they considered they only were users of our station, but they they never asked themselves if it could be a, a better solution to be on the continent. So uh, that's sort of this question that uh, the French Polar Institute start to, uh, to ask the, the scientists. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yannick. And actually that's a wonderful uh, word of finish as a, as a way to also empower the users, uh, not to only be users or passive users, but also contributors and think about the overall system and about um, what we, uh, where we have uh, other uh, competencies where we can contribute. And for, for my part, I, I take uh, from, from this workshop uh, the importance of dialogue and the multiple 
uh, points of views, but also the necessity for transparency and uh, probably some sort of methodologies that we need to develop in order to be able to have meaningful transparency. Otherwise, we are talking about different things. Um, and finally, um, I would like to thank you all very much for being present, for contributing. I hope this was useful. This is by no way, by no, no means the end of this conversa conversation, uh, much more um, the start of a growing awareness. And I think in the same way as uh, Yannick and certainly uh, colleagues, uh, other colleagues who spoke today, invite you to follow up on these discussions uh, in your grants and in our conversations and in your inputs in our uh, different conferences and grants. Um, and on this, I would like to thank you all very much and close this the workshop. And we are almost right on time. Um, this is uh, very timely. So thank you all very much and have a very nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.